الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. إن شاء الله نكمل مع الرسالة أو الكتاب عن تحقيق كلمة الإخلاص. الكتاب من ابن رجب رحمه الله عن كلمة لا إله إلا الله and establishing it and knowing the virtue of it and the proper understanding of it and many other topics related to this. And the last thing that we mentioned about this is the, after mentioning the ayat of the Quran and the hadith or some of the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, that mentions the virtue of la ilaha illallah and that these hadiths are of two types. Some of these hadiths mentions that whoever says la ilaha illallah, he will enter Jannah. And the other hadith says that whoever says la ilaha illallah and is upon la ilaha illallah, he will be forbidden from the hellfire. And the explanation of these hadiths as it shows the virtue of la ilaha illallah, but it does not contradict the other hadith and the verses of the Quran that talks about some of the muhideen, some of those who are upon the tawheed, those who die on la ilaha illallah, some of them will enter the hellfire because of their actions, because of sins. Uh, so to uh, describe these hadith in the light of the other hadith and the subject of the shafa'a of the Prophet والسلام, the intercession and so on, is that the hadith uh, means that whoever dies on la ilaha illallah, whoever dies on the state of al-Islam, uh, either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive them if they died in the state of sins. Because if they repented to Allah, they die in the state of la ilaha illallah, and they repented from all sins, there's no punishment for them, of course. And if they die in the state of sin, they did not repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from, either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive them, or if they entered the hellfire, they won't be in it forever. So this is how the hadiths are to be explained. Uh, the Jannah will be for them, it doesn't mean that they won't be punished before that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will for some of them to be punished. And the hadith that talks about them being forbidden from the fire, it means they won't be forbidden, uh, the, they will be forbidden from the fire to be in it forever. But it's valid that some of them will enter the fire and the fire for the believers is purification if they did not purify themselves in this life. And we talked about the importance of making sure that we purify ourselves in this life from the sins. Because the sins in this life is fire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that in the Quran in the example of taking the wealth of the orphans. Those who consume the wealth of the orphans, they are uh, taken in their own stomach fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it fire. And they will be burned in the fire in the, in the day of judgment. So the easier thing is to repent constantly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in that state of purification. So without going into the details of what's mentioned before, he continues to explain these types of hadith and why this is from the aqidah perspective so that a person does not fall into any deviation. Because it's a matter of fact that some of the deviant sects deviated because of the misunderstanding of the ayat and the hadith that talks about la ilaha illallah. So some of them, they took these verses or these hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and they said no sin harms a person whatsoever. If you just say la ilaha illallah, that is sufficient and this is the like of the murji'a deviant sects. And many people, they have this evil belief. That as long as you say la ilaha illallah, it doesn't matter if you're sinful, it doesn't matter if you make salah, like this. And this is such an evil belief. And on the other side, the other extreme, those who would uh, attribute kufr and disbelief to those who commit sins, like the khawarij and the like of them. And the people of Ahl Sunnah, they bring all of these ayat and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and explain it in the light of what is muhkam, of what is clear. So if you were with us before, inshallah ta'ala, he continues. So hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, it becomes clear. He then says, هذا, the like of what's mentioned is قال, الله, I have been commanded to fight the people till they bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the messenger of Allah. And of course, an-nas here is not all the people because 
hum the believers are, are also from the nest, or from the people, so they're not, they're excluded from this. And also those who have treaty with the Prophet ﷺ or with the believers are excluded from this. So what is left is those who are in state of war. Uh, and it's not about uh, forcing anyone to believe in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then he says with regards to this, فَفَهِمَ عُمَرُ وَجَمَاعَةٌ مِّنَ الصَّحَابَةِ Umar radiallahu anhu and a group from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they understood from this, أَنَّ مَنْ أَتَى بِالشَّهَادَتَيْنِ امْتَنْعَ مِنْ عُقُوبَةِ الدُّنْيَا بِمُجَرَّدِ ذَلِكِ Whoever says the shahadatin, he is protected from the punishment in this worldly life. Once they say the shahadatin. فَتَوَقَّفُوا فِي قِتَالِ مَا نِعِ الزَّكَاهِ So they abstained from approving, fighting those who stopped giving the zakah after the Prophet ﷺ died. As we know, when the Prophet ﷺ died, some of the, uh, the, the Bedouins or some of the, the places not in Medina, they said the zakah was only at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so they stopped giving the zakah. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he decided to fight against them as he will mention that. But Umar radiallahu anhu and some of the companions radiallahu anhu, they uh, disputed the matter with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in a good way. How can you uh, fight someone that says la ilaha illallah, they are believers. So Fahim al-Siddiq, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu understood from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that he would not fight them unless they fulfill the rights of La ilaha illallah. So La ilaha illallah has rights to be fulfilled and not just a word to be said. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, as a continuation of the previous hadith, فَإِذَا فَعَلُوا ذلك مَنَعُوا مِنِّي دِمَاءَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ إِلَّا بِحَقِّهَا وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And if they do that, uh, that means they're upon uh, the, the shahadatin, uh, they will be protected with regards to their blood and wealth, إِلَّا بِحَقِّهَا except by its rights. وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And their reckoning is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وقال الزكاة حق المال And zakah is the right of the money, is the right of the wealth. It's not an optional thing because this is the right of the poor and it's not an optional thing for the rich yet they have to give their zakah. So he says, This is what As-Siddiq, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he understood. قَدْ رَوَاهُ عَنِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ صَرِيحًا جَمَاعَةٌ مِّنَ الصَّحَابَةِ Many of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, they narrated this, من هو من عمر وأنس وغيرهما and he mentioned the previous hadith that we heard and in it, وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَيُؤْتُ الزَّكَةِ that they establish the salah and they give the zakah. And also the ayah in Surah At-Tawbah, verse number 5, فَإِن تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةَ فَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَهُمْ If they repented to Allah and they established the salah, they pay the zakah, then set them free. And another verse, فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ Then they are your brothers in the deen. So not just لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله, but also to establish the salah and to give the zakah. So he says, على أن الأخوة في الدين لا تثبت إلا بأداء الفرائض مع التوحيد. So the brotherhood in the deen for the sake of Allah is not to be established except by fulfilling the obligations with the tawheed. So this is clear evidences that a person is not a brother in matters of deen for the sake of Allah unless they establish the fara'id. If he does not establish the fard, the obligations, like establishing the salah, the ayah, the understanding of the ayah, then that means they're not your brothers in the deen, unless they repent. Because the tawbah from the shirk uh, is not ever attained unless a person is upon the tawheed. Because that what negates the tawheed is the shirk associating partners with Allah. And when Abu Bakr anhu established this very clearly, the Sahaba, those who were the like of Umar radiallahu anhu, they took their opinion back and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in their hearts what Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was upon and they were convinced fully with regards to the opinion of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and they fought these uh, people, those who abstained from giving the zakah. فَإِذَا عُلِمَ أَنَّ عُقُوبَةَ الدُّنْيَا So taking this as an evidence again, if it's known that the punishment of this worldly life 
لا ترتفع عمن ادى الشهادتين مطلقا it does not get lifted from those who says the shahadatain and that's it in the absolute sense only بل قد يعاقب باخلال بحق من حقوق الاسلام a person can also be punished if he does not fulfill one of the rights of al-Islam. And of course, those who would punish are the people of authority, not the individuals. So the same thing with the punishment of the hereafter. So this is what he mentioned, these evidences to show that the punishment in the hereafter is uh, for those who uh, are upon a shirk, associating partners with Allah, and also there is a punishment for those who are upon the Tawheed, but they did not fulfill the obligations, that means they died in the state of sin. So some of them will be punished and some of them will be forgiven. So that people do not fall again into this deviant belief that it's only La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah and the actions are not that important or it's not part of Al Iman. Uh, and bear with me, inshallah ta'ala, with. with more of details of this because this is an important thing because he gets into the next subject. He says, which again, great benefits to learn from the ways of the early generations of Islam. He said, explaining these hadith. Some of the people of knowledge, they explain these hadith also uh, and the like of it, uh, that it was before the ayat that uh, was revealed to the Prophet والسلام, stating the fara'it, the obligations and the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. And I mean, some of them, they said, the ayat or the hadith that talks about La ilaha illallah ever says it enters Jannah and so on. It was said before the establishment of the fard or the obligations. Among them is the Imam al-Zuhri wa al-Thawri wa ghayruhuma. But then he said, وَهَذَا بَعِيدٌ جِدًّا This is بَعِيد far. That means this opinion is not correct. It's far from being correct. Why? فَإِنَّ كَثِيرٌ مِنَا كَانَ بِالْمَدِينَةِ These hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said about the virtue of La ilaha illallah, many of it was in Medina after the revelation of the fara'id, the obligations and the hudud and the, and the punishments and so on. وَفِي بَعْضِهَا And some of it was in the battle of Tabuk, which is at the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So if you come across this understanding, uh, this is not the correct opinion, but he explains why some of these Ima they said that, and it's also a great benefit to understand that sometimes you have to understand how the early generations of Islam they used certain terminologies. He says some of them would say in this hadith of that mentioned about La ilaha illallah ever enters it enter Jannah, says it enters Jannah, uh, and innaha mansukha. Some said that it's abrogated by the other hadith that talks about those who commit sins, they would enter the hellfire unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them. وَمِنُهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ هِيَ مُحْكَمًا Some said it's muhkama, it's not abrogated, it's not cancelled. And you know the nasq the definition of a nasq uh, by the people of al-usul is that you have a later uh, ruling that would abrogate or cancel an earlier ruling as the rulings were revealed in a gradual way. So this is what an nasq means as far as the subject of usul fiqh. So some said it's muhkama. وَلَكِنْ ضُمَّ إِلَيَا شَرَائِطْ Those who said that it's not abrogated, but there are conditions attached to it. This hadith that says لا إله إلا الله as mentioned last time. And then he brings this important thing is uh, if, if the nas, we don't have to uh, you know, talk about this for so long, but what, what, if, if the text, if the hadith has an extension or something more, some they would consider that extension is a sign of abrogation. And there's khilaf differences of opinions among the people of usul in this. But this is a different subject. But anyway, he says, So Imam al-Thawri, rahimahullah, when he said it's mansukha, it's abrogated. I hope that you're following with me. I didn't lose it yet, inshallah. Uh, and what's abrogated it and what cancelled it is the fara'id, the obligations and, and, and the warning against uh, not fulfilling the obligations. But what they meant with the nasq, what they meant with the abrog abrogation is not the same as the definition of the abrogation, which they meant by an nasq al-bayan wal idah. They meant by the word an nasq or abrogation is that it clarifies things. So you have a hadith that talks about whoever enters, whoever says la ilaha illallah will enter Jannah. Where's the actions? 
other hadith talks about whoever do certain actions or whoever does not do the obligations, he will subject himself to the punishment of the hellfire. So these second types of hadith has more clarification to the hadith that talks about la ilaha illallah. Why? Because, and this is the very important benefit for us to understand here, to humble ourselves to knowledge. He said, فَإِنَّ السَّلَفَ كَانُوا يُطْلِقُونَ النَّسْخَ عَلَى مِثْلِ ذَلِكَ كَثِيرًا The Salaf, the early generations of Islam used to say the word nasq and they mean by it clarification and not necessarily the meaning of a nasq which is abrogation. You understand? So that means the words or the terminologies it is not sufficient for a person to see it and to explain it. Do you need to know how people would use these terminologies at their time? The same thing with the Quran. The language of the Quran is the Arabic language. But how they use these words at the time of the Prophet And it's all saved for us. So, and the same thing when a person reads some of the statements or hadith of the Prophet or statements from the early generations of Islam. If a person is not well versed in matters of knowledge, he can easily misunderstand. And you say that Imam al thawri said that this is abrogation. But did you understand what does he mean by the word nasq? He does not mean that it's abrogated another ruling. Uh, this is something that was common among them that they would use the word an-nasq or abrogation and they mean by that more clarification. So what they meant by that for those who said that the hadith were abrogated is that the ayat of the obligations of the furud and the fara'id and the hudud it clarifies that the entering the jannah or to be saved from the hellfire it has to be done with fulfillment of the fara'id, the obligations, and staying away from haram. So this is how these ayat that talks about the obligatory actions and forbidding sins basically clarified more the other ayat that talks about whoever says la ilaha illallah will enter So this is how the Quran explain itself. And also the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, that means mansukha ay mubayyana, mubayyana mufassara. It's explained and it's made very clear. And when usus al-fara'id wal hudud nasikha ay mufassira. So if they say that, that means the verses of the obligations explained in more details of what la ilaha illallah means. And we talked about how la ilaha illallah is the key to Jannah, and every key has the teeth of it. That means without the teeth, the key is of no benefit whatsoever. So uh, this is just something on the way like this. But one of the, in my opinion, for us to learn from it is to humble ourselves to ilm and not to have this, uh, you know, to, for a person to think I can read whatever books and I can make whatever rulings because it's very important to understand the way the ulama use the language of ilm. The ilm has language to it, which is, of course, the Arabic language, but not just any Arabic language which requires for the person to learn the methods of ilm in the proper way from the people of knowledge. Uh, he says also, others they said, تلك النصوص المطلقة قد جاءت مقيدة في أحريثة أخر Some of these texts that talks about لا إله إلا الله and the virtue of لا إله إلا الله and this is what makes a person enter Jannah there are conditions attached to it mentioned in the same narrations. For example, the hadith من قال لا إله إلا الله مخلصا Whoever says لا إله إلا الله purely, sincerely for the sake of Allah he will enter Jannah. So these hadith did not just, just say whoever says la ilaha illallah will enter Jannah. No, there is a, a condition here mentioned which is it said with ikhlas, with sincerity, that a person is sincerely saying it, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And in some of the narrations, mustaqinan bi qalbu, that means he has yaqeen, he says la ilaha illallah with certainty that his heart is certain upon the meaning of la ilaha illallah that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. And some of these uh, hadith also says يصدق قلبه لسانة that he says la ilaha illallah and his heart is, uh, is being upon the truth of what his, uh, st his tongue is saying. So uh, the tongue and the heart are all both together in the belief in la ilaha illallah. Not just someone said it with his tongue only. So if someone, uh, people would say to him, say the shahada, he doesn't understand what he's saying. Or his heart is not upon it, it does not benefit him. So he has to have the conviction of it in his heart 
they believe the sincerity the yaqeen and also in some other hadith yaqulu haqqan min qalbi whoever says la ilaha illallah haqqan truly from his heart and in some of the narrations qad dhalla biha lisanu wa tma'anna biha qalbu his tongue humbled by saying it and his heart is in state of tranquility with it he's not in dispute in his heart with regards to la ilaha illallah which all shows the importance of amalul qalb the actions done by the heart and the heart being established with ash-shahadatin so again the point here is la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah when he says ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh is not just with one's lips it's with certainty with sincerity and these are the like of the conditions of la ilaha illallah for it to be accepted by a person so he says fatahaqququhu bi qawli la ilaha illallah how to establish la ilaha illallah in our hearts the foundation of it he says alla ya'laha al qalb ghayr allah that the heart does not ya'lah illa allah ya'lah is the verb of ilah meaning that the heart does not worship other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ya'lah as linguistically refers to uh, the the intense and the perfect love and devotion which is basically the meanings of the ibadah so the heart has to be full of this this is how to establish la ilaha illallah in the heart to uh, for the heart does not worship other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all what that means with the devotion with the love of allah with the fear with hope for the rewards from allah as he says hubban wa rajaan wa khawfan wa tawakkulan wa isti'anatan wa khudu'an wa inabatan wa talaban this is how to establish la ilaha illallah in our hearts that a person worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his heart is full of the love of Allah al-raja to hope for the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when a person do acts of obedience to Allah khawfan to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tawakkulan to rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isti'anatan to seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala khudu'an to humble oneself to submit oneself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa inabatan to always return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with uh, with matters of knowledge and with repentance وطلباً, and seeking everything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is how to perfect la ilaha illallah in our hearts otherwise if a person does not fulfill these actions it doesn't make him a disbeliever but it weakens la ilaha illallah in his heart and if it weakens la ilaha illallah in the heart that means the actions will be uh, as a result of that not according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from the people that means would be acts of obedience, acts of sins, because of the heart is not well established on la ilaha illallah. And if the heart is well established on la ilaha illallah, then the body follows. Submission becomes so easy. And we don't need to uh, mention examples with this. This is very obvious to every uh, single human being. Right? Whatever the heart is attached to, you find your physical actions, actions you, have, you have it easy for you. If you have a passion in doing something, you find the physical actions very easy for you. Someone else doesn't have it in his heart, it becomes very difficult for him. What made it difficult or easy when people both they have the same physical abilities is what's in the hearts. And you can see that uh, also clearly as the example that is always mentioned, that if you have someone that you love so much and you didn't see that person for a long time, and if he walks in and you stand with that person talking with him for a long time, you won't feel the pain in your foot that you've been standing for a long time. Because what's carrying you? Your heart. It is not your legs carrying you anymore. Your heart is carrying you. What's in the heart that is carrying you? That love to that person. That you, you miss that person. It's all deeds done by the, by the heart. And you realize that you're standing for half an hour and you don't feel any pain. And then you see how when we stand in the salah for a few minutes, all the pain and the, you know, you can't wait till the salah is finished because the heart is full of filth, forgetfulness attached to this worldly life. And when we compare our hearts to the hearts of the, to the heart of the Prophet والسلام, the hearts of the companions عنهم, where they would stand in the salah, especially the, the night salah, of course the fawda salah, we are commanded to make it not long, but with regards to the optional salah. And the Prophet والسلام, would stand till his foot would swell. والسلام. He's not standing والسلام, struggling with pain. He's not punishing himself as ignorant people might think. 
he is standing in, in, in such a state that he said alayhi salatu wasalam wa ju'ilat qurratu ayni fi salah the comfort, the jewel of my eyes have been made in salah so once he enters the salah this is the comfort of his eyes and he would stand for so long that he doesn't feel that his leg is swelling because of the long standing in the salah and all of that is because this is the perfect heart the most perfect heart that ever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created is the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa this is the purest heart ever and we are commanded to follow the way of the Prophet and when we say to follow the Prophet not just to follow the outside appearance this is to be followed and not to belittle it whatsoever but also which is the foundation of that is to follow the way the heart of the Prophet was with the worship of Allah with the love of Allah these acts of uh, worship of Allah that is done by the heart with the nasiha, the sincerity towards every Muslim the concern to have in the heart towards every Muslim uh, all kinds of deeds done by the heart and that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised the Prophet والسلام, by saying that indeed you are upon great manners والسلام, all of that the foundation of it is in the heart and we can go on with this and he will explain more of the how to establish la ilaha illallah in the hearts and that's why the tawheed is the most important subject and that's why we need to spend more time talking about la ilaha illallah and the importance of it and to relate everything to la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah so if you find uh, oneself committing a sin there is weakness in the heart uh, it is not this person or that person there is some weakness in the heart that led the person to fall into that sin and that's why he need to be instead of being terrified he needs to purify his heart immediately by repenting to Allah a tawbah wash it, washes away the filth in the heart and it might not be washed right away and that's why he constantly need to repent to Allah constantly needs to seek forgiveness from Allah till the hearts are washed away from this and to fill it with uh, as we heard these acts of obedience to Allah same thing if the heart is full of filth of listening to music or looking at haram or whatever to keep on being patient with oneself to fill the heart with the Quran with the speech of Allah reciting it listening to it re uh, reviewing it memorizing it and it's a constant struggle and striving till the heart is full of that and so on so this is how to make the tahqiq or the establishment of la ilaha illallah briefly and he says wa tahqquhu how to establish and the word tahakkuk is not just how to say it or how to no, tahqiq Muhammad Rasulullah that means you establish it you make it a reality you make it uh, and it comes from al haqq the truthfulness that a person is upon Muhammad Rasulullah upon that shahada as he's upon la ilaha illallah Allah yu'bad Allah bi ghayri ma shara'ahu Allah ala lisani Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not to be worshipped except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated and revealed on the speech and the tongue of the, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He is the one alayhi wa wasalam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us how to worship Allah. So when you say ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, what does that mean? He's the messenger of Allah. He's the messenger from Allah to you to follow his example. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهُ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهُ كَثِيرًا Indeed, in the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم, you have the best example for those who hope for the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rewards in, in the hereafter. And this is a conviction in the heart. Ulama might have differences of opinions in some things. This is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and someone else says, no, this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and it's a valid differences of opinion. This is valid. It's okay. The problem is which is mandatory upon every Muslim. We have to differentiate between what's in the level of knowledge that a person needs to seek versus what is mandatory upon every Muslim. What is mandatory upon every single Muslim, the most lay person, he has to have in his heart that if it's made clear to him, and you put many lines under if, that this is the way of the Prophet ﷺ, he would not do anything but this. Right, so how that becomes clear, this is something else. But we're talking about the conviction in the heart. And that's what the statement of Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, 
أنه من استبانت له سنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لم يكن ليدعاها لقول أحد Whoever made clear to him the way of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام it is not permissible for him to leave it for the statement of anyone else uh, but how to establish this this is the levels of knowledge and it's valid to have differences of opinions because of many different reasons but again what is an obligation in the heart of every Muslim when he says Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah that if the Prophet ﷺ is right in front of him and he says do this or not to do this would he say let me first uh, see what my what uh, my parents would say or something like this he would submit himself fully to what the Prophet ﷺ said and this ruling is not abrogated it's not mansukh after the Prophet ﷺ returned to Allah it's valid till the day of judgment but the Prophet ﷺ he said al-anbiya the people of knowledge are the inheritors of the prophets and that's why people they ask the people of knowledge and there are some things is valid to have differences of opinions and some other things is not valid to have differences of opinions. is it valid to have differences of opinions whether khamr is halal or haram there's no such a thing it's known in matters of religion by necessity uh, is it valid to have differences of opinion whether dhuhr is four or five rak'ah this is very obvious one Right, so there are things that are consensus among the Ummah, <clears throat> well established in the deen of Allah, matters of aqeedah, matters of belief, the proper understanding of la ilaha illallah. But in matters of fiqh and the, these types of matters, this is where still the hearts can be together upon la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah because this is the concern of every believer. So again, when this is mentioned briefly, but we're talking about tahqiq la ilaha illallah. That's what the this uh, Risala by Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, the title of it is Tahqiq Kalimatul Ikhlas, to establish the word of purity which is La ilaha illallah and Muhammadur Rasulullah. And that's how this meaning came into the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, when he said, Man qala la ilaha illallah mukhlisan dakhal al jannah. Whoever says La ilaha illallah mukhlisan while being in a state of al ikhlas sincerity, he will enter Jannah. It was said, and by the way, this narration is weak. Da'if, but he was, he'll, he'll say why it's da'if and why, uh, why he's mentioning it, mentioning it even if it's weak. He says, ما إخلاصها يا رسول الله? What's the ikhlas of this kalima? What is the ikhlas of la ilaha illallah? What is the purity and the sincerity of la ilaha illallah? O Messenger of Allah, he said, قال أن تحجزك عن كل ما حرم الله عليك. The purity of it is that it تحجزك that means it makes it a barrier for you, takes you away from everything that Allah forbade. This is how if la ilaha illallah is established in the heart, it will take you away from the haram. It does not make you sinless, right? But it does not make the person persistently falling into the path of sin. If someone falls into the path of sin, major sins, and he's not repenting to Allah. And he says, I won't never repent to Allah from this sin. Does that make, a, make him a disbeliever? No. It does not make him a disbeliever. Right? But he's very evil. He's, he's doing something very bad. But it doesn't make him a disbeliever. Of course, he's, you know, he's in great danger. But there's no, it does not make him a disbeliever. But it's a sign that la ilaha illallah is weak in his heart. He has a weak iman. So the, to establish la ilaha illallah is not just to have the minimum requirement of it, it's to perfect it, and that is to make the, it makes the person away from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid. He says, وَهَذَا يُرُوَ مِنْ حَدِيثِ أَنَسِ بْنِ مَالِكُ وَزَيْدِ بْنِ أَرْقَمُ وَلَكِنْ إِسْنَادَهُ مَلَا صِحْهُ The isnad of this hadith is not uh, authentic. وَجَاءَ أَيْضًا مِنْ مَرَسِيلِ حَسَنِ وَنَحْوُ And also came from the marasil. Al-Hasan al-Wasri used to make uh, statements without mentioning the Sahabi, this is Hadith Mursal. Uh, but the meaning is correct. Right? So that's why the ulama, when they include some of the weak Hadith in their books, they are referring to the meanings of it. So the meaning is correct, even though we can't say that for sure the Prophet ﷺ said that because of the other Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and before that, the Ayat of the Qur'an. So uh, I know that... Uh, a little bit more inshallah ta'ala so is, is the meaning here correct and meaning that we understand how to establish in principle la ilaha illallah and then we spend our life making sure that nothing would undermine the perfection of la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah that's why he says wa tahqiqu hadha al-ma'na wa idahuhu 
to make the establishment of this meaning and to make it very clear and قول العبد that when the abd, the servant of Allah says لا إله إلا الله يقتضي that means this is as, as a result of that ألا إله له غير الله that he has no one to worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala والإله what is الإله means the one to be worshipped right هو الذي يطاع فلا يعصى الإله is the one that is obeyed and not to be disobeyed هيبة له وإجلالا he is the one to be obeyed and not to be disobeyed هيبة له وإجلالا exalting with, as a result of exalting Allah سبحانه وتعالى and having the greatness of Allah in the heart because a person might obey some form of authority but not because he has he believes that it's such a great thing in his heart he's not exalting it he's just obeying it because he fears the consequences of not obeying it but the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obedient ta'a ta'atun haybatan wa ijlalan to exalt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's why the believers they obey him and not just that wa mahabbatan with the full and the perfect love of Allah so when a person is obedient to Allah he's doing that because of the love of Allah in his heart if he's staying away from sins he's doing that because of the love of Allah even though he loves something but Allah forbade him from it so because of the love of Allah that overpowers the love of his own things that he loves he would leave it for the sake of Allah وخوفاً, and also with the fear of Allah ورجاءً, all of these are the acts of worship that is mentioned hoping for the rewards from Allah توكلاً عليه to rely upon Allah وسؤالاً من one asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, from all kinds of the bounties of Allah ودعاءً له and making dua ولا يصلح ذلك كله إلا لله and all of that is not يصلح is not right to be done to other than Allah and this is how the actions are related to لا إله إلا الله and if a person doesn't find that in himself he need to establish this in his heart and to ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى for it and to have the love of Allah the rest of these actions therefore فمن أشرك مخلوقا whoever has a partner with Allah سبحانه وتعالى a مخلوق a creation with, of, uh, of Allah سبحانه وتعالى in any of these things which is from the attributes of al ilahiyya the attributes of being the ilah the one to be worshipped so whoever has partners with Allah in this ijlal, in this ta'zim, not any ta'zim, not any exaltation, it's when someone exalt a creation of Allah in the ways that it's only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be attributed to Allah, then he made a shirk in this, in this regard. For example, that's why al-halif bighayr Allah is haram. When you swear by other than Allah, is shirk. Why? Because when you swear by something, you're exalting it. And that exaltation is not permissible except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. If you have to swear, then you swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Other than Allah, that means you exalted other than Allah, in which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be exalted in this. The same thing with al-mahabba, uh, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the love of the ta'zim also, the love that includes the exaltation of Allah. Not the natural love that a person has to another human being, Right? It's the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nothing is the like of it. And as mentioned in the Quran that how to know that you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that state of worship is that if you put that forward before the love of anything in this world. So we have things that we love in this life. You love to rest, you, lo you love to have money, you love to have health, you love to have, you know, you love your mother, you love your wife, you love your children, all kinds of things. Right? Many things that people, and the word love is instead of like, and people have contaminated the word love. They only use it in the sinful act sometimes. No, mahabba, love, right? So if the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hearts of the believers, and it's challenged by the love of things in this, in this world, the believers will put forward the love of Allah. So if he loves his wife so much, but his wife wants him to commit a sin, the love of Allah comes first. A husband wants her to commit a sin, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes first, regardless of the consequences of this. So the same thing with the fear of Allah, hope for the words from Allah. You hope from a human being, but you're hoping what from a creation of Allah. They cannot do nothing for you except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will for it to be. So all of these things, either you do it sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or it will be contaminated 
it can reach the level of shirk wal billah. So uh, he says it becomes, uh, does not perfect his ikhlas when he says la ilaha illallah. And it causes him to have deficiency in his tawheed. وَكَانَ فِيهِ مِنْ عُبُودِيَّةِ ذَلِكَ الْمَخْلُوقِ بِحَسْبِ مَا فِيهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ We have to really reflect upon this. Uh, and we talked about that before many times. But we need to always remember it. Okay, the, for example, the fear of Allah. There is a space in your heart to perfect the fear of Allah. If the fear of Allah is weak, is not as perfect as it should be, it's not going to be vacuum. If it's correct to say that, it will be filled with the fear of other than Allah. Right? So if someone, say, if, if someone does not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most perfect way, that means he fear other than Allah in which it's supposed to be only the fear of Allah. Not the normal fear that you fear to be uh, sick or the fear of, uh, of a lion running towards you. This is natural fear. We're not talking about this. But the fear that makes a person worship other than Allah or even obey other than Allah uh, in the disobedience of Allah. So this is what he's mentioning here. So you have, you know, the, the law of energy. But we're not talking about the laws of energy. Right, that, that there's, it does not disappear. Right, it changes from one form to the other. Right, may Allah forgive me. I'm not talking about this. I'm just. Uh, but the concept here is that the ubudiyah, if it's not fulfilled perfectly, if a person does not worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the perfect way, that means he is falling into some ubudiyah to other than Allah. He's falling into some servitude to other than Allah. This can be shirk. This can be minor shirk. Sins can be understood from that perspective, but not the shirk that takes a person outside the fold of Islam or makes a person disbeliever. But it's a very serious matter. And this is how everything can be related to the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why he says, وَهَذَا كُلُّهُ مِنْ فُرُوعِ الشِّرْكِ So our job in this life is when we talk about these acts of worship to be done by the heart, is to perfect it, is to complete it. And the way to do that is to work on oneself, and to physically do the acts that makes a person have the love of Allah and the fear of Allah and so on, and to constantly repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to read the Qur'an frequently. When a person reads the Qur'an and reflects upon the Qur'an, he's reading this, the speech of Allah. So he will have this ta'zeem of Allah. He will see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most perfect with his names and attributes. And he will see how the human beings are nothing whatsoever and they have no power whatsoever. So because it's always either or. So uh, after saying this, he says, وَلِهَذَا وَرَدْ إِطْلَاقُ الْكُفْرِ وَالشِّرْكِ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِّنَ الْمَعَاصِي Warad came into the narrations, the word kufr and shirk, in many of the sins. And this is also something not to confuse sins versus kufr and shirk. But you would find sins mentioned in the hadith, but it's given the word kufr or shirk. التي من شأوها من طاعة غير الله. Why it's, it's given the word shirk or kufr? Because it originates from being obedient to other than Allah. So this is the seed of it. أو خوفي أو رجاء or his fear or his hope or the tawakkul or to do an act for other than Allah. Like the word shirk when it's attributed to الرياء. الرياء is show off. The Prophet ﷺ called it shirk. Hidden shirk, minor shirk, but he called it shirk. Why? Because a riya is when someone shows, he wants to show people that he's obedient to Allah. Who's the one that you're supposed to show your acts of obedience? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that you want to show it, uh, you know, your act of obedience, it's shown when you make salah, when you make salah al maghrib, it's shown to everybody. Everybody sees it. Uh, so it's not about hiding your actions. It's about in your heart, and only Allah knows what's in your heart, that your intention is that you're not showing the human beings, you're not seeking the pleasure of the human beings, you're seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So if someone show off his actions, this is the word shirk is attributed to this because it's supposed to be only to Allah. And the same thing with swearing by other than Allah. Why? Because it's exalting other than Allah. Making tawakkul on other than Allah, relying on other than Allah in the things that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can uh, fulfill. Even if a person would 
make it seems equal when it comes to the will, the will of Allah and the will of the makhluk, the creation of Allah. مثل أن يقول when he says ما شاء الله وشاء فلان. If he says if Allah wills and so and so will. And we heard the hadith of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام before that when a man he said to the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام ما شاء الله وشئت. If Allah wills and if you will, the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام got angry and he said أجعلتني لله ندا. You made me you made me a partner with Allah. Say ما شاء الله وحدة. Say only by the will of Allah or say ما شاء الله ثم then. If you will, in the category of being a makhluk, but the the wow, as if they are equal. And the same thing when a person says, "Mali illa Allah wa ant," someone says, "I I have nobody in this life except Allah and you." That statement is a sign that the heart has weakness in it, and a person has to be even careful with what he says. It's only wa, only and, no remove the and. Say, I have no one. by you know to seek help from except Allah or except Allah then when you say then that means you get into the categories of the creation from the creation of Allah I have nobody but you there's nothing wrong with that but when you say it like this in the absolute sense even though your intention is not like this but this is how to be careful with what we say because it affects the hearts and it's it's all mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet the last thing before we end today, inshallah ta'ala. وَكَذَلِكَ مَا يَقْدَحُ فِي التَّوَكُّلْ What affects the tawakkul. The tawakkul is ibadah. Each and every one of these things is an act of worship that we need to spend time to learn it and to practice it. The same way that we spend time to learn the salah and zakah and so on, we need to spend time to learn how to make tawakkul upon Allah. And we need that every day. And it's easy to understand what a tawakkul is. To rely with your heart upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while taking the means. Then every day we are faced with all kinds of trials with this. So if you fall short, work on yourself till you perfect the tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything that negates this or weakens this, a tawakkul, or what a fadlullahi bin nafi wa dur, benefits and harms, it's only from Allah. It's not from the human beings. The human beings, they benefit one another, they harm one another, yes. But in your heart, right, you're only seeing the actions of Allah. You're seeing that human being is nothing but someone that Allah sent on you to harm you or to benefit you. Right? The rulings of the dunya applies. That person is to be taken to the authorities, yes, and to be all of that is to not to say, well, that's uh, the will of Allah and, and you just let things to be chaos in this life. No, we're talking about the hearts, witnessing that everything is by Allah. النفع والضر benefit and harm كالطيرة that's why those who they see something and they become pessimist because they saw an owl or they whatever days or things like this والرقى المكروهة إنه ممكن رقية that is disliked or going to the Kohen to the sorcerers or the future sayers or whatever and to believe in them all of that negates the توحيد because of these types of things that negates the توكل and to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is the owner of all things. And you, then the next thing we'll talk about, ittiba'u al-hawa, to follow the desires. How is that related to la ilaha illallah? So one of the enjoyment matters in this life, and if you don't find it, ask. Ask the people of knowledge. How to relate everything to la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Everything in one's life. If you're not able to make that relationship, acquire the knowledge of it. So that the person is constantly perfecting his la ilaha illallah. But not to relate it to la ilaha illallah in a sense that a person would call people disbelievers. or No, of course not. But to perfect, to complete one's iman, to perfect one's la ilaha illallah with every action, with everything that we stay away from, with the deeds done by the heart. And to constantly be able to, to separate or to categorize the actions. Now you're making tawakkul. Now you're having the love of Allah. Now you're having the fear of Allah. Now you have the hope for the rewards from Allah. These are actions done and they can be more than one done at the same time in the heart. So it's not just physical actions. So when you, when you, when you treat someone nicely, for example, when you don't feel like it, but it's because of the love of Allah. Because of the fear of Allah that if you would say something bad or backbiting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade you from this. So the heart is working, is not just the norm, 
It's all come, and this is how to perfect and to train oneself. I hope this meaning is clear. Right? So it's not, for example, backbiting. Uh, and you're, you're sitting and you're not backbiting. Why? Because you fear Allah. Try to bring the meaning of the fear of Allah in the heart. Or hoping for the rewards from Allah. Or the love of Allah. Not because if I backbite him, uh, that would upset him. Or uh, maybe he will backbite me then back. or cause It's not because of these things. It's because of what's in your heart. Of these actions which perfects one's tawheed. We continue inshallah ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us comprehend what we hear. And I hope it's uh, benefiting and we can understand that inshallah. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, من كان آخر كلامه لا إله إلا الله دخل الجنة. Whoever his last words is لا إله إلا الله will enter Jannah. This is what he mentioned in the beginning that it doesn't mean that he would not enter the hellfire. It means whoever his last words is لا إله إلا الله either that means he will enter Jannah from the first instant or if he enters the hellfire he is not going to be in the hellfire forever. So he will enter Jannah. But to enter Jannah from the first instant, conditions has to be met and things like this. And it doesn't negate the fact that he might enter the Hafai, but eventually he will enter Jannah. If a person dies on La ilaha illallah, he enters Jannah. Now. But who can sustain the Hafai for one second? No one. Right? And that's why it's uh, subhanAllah. And, the, and, and if a person belittles this, also this is a dangerous thing. As Bani Israel, when they said, When they said we will only be touched by the hellfire in only counted days. So, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You took a covenant from Allah that that's what's going to happen to you, or you say about Allah what you do not know. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the hellfire. Now, this ayah in Surah Maryam, which has caused uh, some even of the early generations of Islam to have so much fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which the ayah says, illa that none of you, unless he will, wariduha. And the word wariduha re refers to the half fire. Uh, that means al wurud is when you have, it's a word used when the camels are brought to drink. So they, there's a pond of water or something like this and you bring the camels to to drink so none of you unless they will go to the fire either they that means they will pass on top of the fire or literally it can means that they will be they will enter the fire it can mean this literally but because of the ayat and the other hadith of the prophet we know for sure that some people would not enter the fire and know that the sarat is on top of the fire so people, when they pass on top of the Sarat, the hellfire is underneath them, and Jannah on the other side. That's what the ayah says, Then we will save the people of Taqwa. And we will leave the Zalimin, the wrongdoers, in the hellfire, they would fall into the hellfire. So this is from the hadith of the Prophet, and even the Quran, that talks about a Sarat, and this is the Wurud, this is the way that people will cross, the hellfire to enter the jinn, which is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it this way. Which shows also in this life, for someone to enter Jannah, he has to cross over all of these tests and trials in this life, which is fire. Right? You come across all kinds of sins and temptations and so on. And the way to save ourselves is with repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly and returning to Allah. المنتحر, the one that committed suicide, does he become a disbeliever if he dies as a muntahir or committed suicide? Uh, this caused uh, some issues in, in, in some countries. 
because when the ulama talked about this, some people they they said, "Oh, you're you're kind of belittling, committing suicide, making it easy for people," because people have had that sense that if someone committed suicide, he's a disbeliever. It's they 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 make it as a default. By default, he's a disbeliever. No, he's not. It's an evil sin. The Prophet والسلام, he said, "Whoever kills himself with a knife." He will be doing this in the Day of Judgment over and over again. Whoever kills himself by falling from a high place, he will do this to himself over and over again right, as a punishment for him. So it's a, a major, major sin. And also someone in that state, if he has his mind and he's not insane, insane or anything like this, uh, that means it can be with a high percentage that he dies in the state of disbelief. So this happens to people, they disbelieve and they die as a result of being disbelievers. But as far as the rulings of the people in this life, we cannot make that decision. Allah knows best. Why? Because also, you know, someone, which is a valid thing, a person might had lost his mind all of a sudden and he, and he killed himself, right? This is valid to have sometimes people, they go mental. Uh, so that might be, they might be not responsible for their actions. Or if they did it and they were responsible for their actions, it's evil, evil actions. But it does not by itself makes a person a disbeliever. So, and it, it does not belittle this evil action. So if someone will add billah committed suicide, the Muslims need to still pray Janazah on him and to bury him among the Muslims. The difference between al-halal and halal and tayyiban, as it's mentioned in the Quran, يا الذين آمنوا كلوا مما في الأرض حلالا طيبا. Eat from what's in the earth halal and طيبا. Halal is permissible and tayyiban that means it's pure, uh, which uh, it's uh, al-halal in general is طيب. Anything that is halal is طيب, is pure. Uh, but halal and tayyiban, that means it's more of an, of an explanation of what people would eat, which is to enjoy it and to enjoy the fact that it's pure. And it's an attribute to the halal, always. So if, uh, if, uh, if there is a halal, that means it's tayyib, it's pure, because it's halal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted, that means it's pure for you, it's not wicked and evil. But something can be halal in itself, but it's not pure, in the sense that a person took it in an unlawful way. So for example, apples are pure. But if he steals it, it's impure for him. Even though it's pure in, its sen in itself, but the way he took it, he took it in an unlawful way. So when you're commanded to, to eat and to use what is halal, also it has to be tayyiban. Even, it doesn't have to be stealing. Like uh, someone is, uh, you're, uh, uh, you're taking something from someone, but he's not at ease with it. You made someone on the spot or become shy to say no. So you took, you took it from him when he's not at ease with it. This is not pure for you. It's something like this. So it has to be permissive, it has to be pure also. And it's also an attribute of the halal. Yes, anything other than eating, because the word eating also is not necessarily the food itself. But sometimes the, 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 the same thing, those who eat the, the wealth of the orphans, it doesn't mean it's only eating, but the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned eating because this is the norm what people would, uh, would, would see of when they earn money, they eat. So this is to make it more clear to the minds of the people. It doesn't have to be eating. It's anything that a person earns, well, and the same thing with clothing, with drinks, with cars, with houses, everything has to be halal.
Now the, right, the question is if someone passed 12th and it was not divided immediately after his death and after five years they discovered it, uh, do they have to pay the care on it on every year uh, that passed without uh, giving the zakah from it till they distributed? The answer is yes. It should be paid zakah on it for the years that it's passed and then it's to be distributed to the, according to the laws of inheritance now. The Imam coming up from Rukur says Allahu Akbar instead of Sami Allah Rahman Hamida. He either have two situations. Either he correct himself, says Allahu Akbar, then Sami Allah Rahman Hamida. Then there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. If he did not correct himself, uh, it's if it depends who you ask. But yes, to make sujood sah. But if he doesn't, the salah is valid. Uh, so it's uh, it's valid Allahu Alam. But it's best to make sujood sah. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن Oh, my God. 